Hi there, welcome back to the channel if you are a subscriber or welcome to the channel if you're new. We post solved and unsolved mysteries on this channel, mainly around serial killers, hence the title. In our third case, we're going to cover the story of a not very well-known Scottish killer that terrorised young girls and women throughout the UK during the 1960s right through to the 2000s. Now, he was actually mistaken for a few other serial killers, such as Bible John, who to this day, is his identity is still unknown, but his story is worth its very own mention. He assaulted, raped and killed three young women, as well as brutalising scores more in his decades-long spree and has been the suspect in a number of ongoing investigations into almost 50 more deaths and missing persons reports. So grab a drink, dim the lights, lock the door. This is the macabre story of Peter Tobin. Peter Britton Tobin was born on the 27th of August 1946 in Johnston, Renrothshire which if you know Scotland is only about a 20 minute drive west of Glasgow. He was the youngest of eight siblings, four sisters and three brothers. So despite having a big family around him, he always felt quite left out and didn't get the attention that he craved from his parents and older siblings. Now, unlike Brady in the previous episode, Tobin was actually quite a problematic child. So the warning signs were there quite early on. Now, at only seven years old, he was actually sent to an approved school which effectively is one step above a boarding school, but one step below a borstal. So it's effectively like your last chance to start behaving and change your behaviours and the way you approach life before you're sent to a borstal. Now at seven years old, to already be in that much trouble. Telltale signs. Sadly, his behaviour didn't improve. Um, and when he was a bit older, he actually supposedly enlisted in the French Foreign Legion. Now, if you don't know what that is, it's like a part of the French army, which is open to non-French citizens to fight for France. Why anyone would want to do that for a country that isn't theirs is peculiar to me. Some sort of interest in bloodletting, possibly, but he could have joined the British army to do that. Unless he wasn't allowed. I don't know. Didn't last long though, and supposedly deserted. Uh, before actually serving time in one of those infamous borstals after committing a number of crimes. Now, at 25 years old, Tobin moved to Brighton, which is in the south of England. Cute little seaside town, so maybe wanted some fresh air. <laughs> With his then girlfriend at the time, 17-year-old Margaret Louise Robertson Mountney. And I'll say that after a few tequilas. You can imagine how many times it took me to say this. Despite the age difference, after moving to Brighton, they got married pretty soon after but the marriage didn't last. As Tobin was arrested and convicted in 1970 for his recent crime spree, which included burglary and forgery. So on the grand scheme of crimes, these are minor offenses, but still he's tiptoeing towards a career criminal path. And surprisingly, she didn't want to stick around with this bad egg. They separated and got divorced within a year in 1971. He didn't wait around long for the next love of his life, as in 1973, he met somebody who was a bit closer to his age, a 30-year-old local nurse, Sylvia Jeffries. They had two children, but sadly their daughter died soon after being born. This marriage also didn't last long, and I'm unsure if it was the death of the daughter or because of Tobin's ways, which you'll find out, but they separated. And in 1976, Sylvia actually fled the family home taking their son with her. There was a bit of a lull in Tobin's love life after this, until 1989 when he actually married somebody called Kathy Wilson, and they had a baby boy later that year, so he had a second son. He'd actually moved his new family back to Scotland in a bit of a hurry, and they didn't know why. But as with my channel, you'll find out the reason later on in this video. It's never a nice reason. Now, there must be clearly something wrong with Tobin because within a year, Kathy had also left him and again, fled from the family home with her son, which was in Bathgate, Scotland, and took him back to her hometown, which is in Portsmouth, again, the south of England. It's about an hour west of Brighton. Now, as usually the case with 
marriages from this time, the accounts from each of the women didn't differ much. Initially, they'd fallen for this charming, well-dressed gentleman in all aspects of the world who didn't take long to turn violent and displayed quite sadistic tendencies. So sadistic, in fact, they feared for their own and their children's lives. Hence why they left pretty quickly and got as far away from Tobin as they could, literally going to the other side of the country to get away from the man. Now, I'm not a licensed practitioner of the hair psychopathy test, but Tobin's next actions would create a probable high score as he moved to Margate in 1991 and then Haven, which is only a five minute drive from Portsmouth, in 1993 to be as close as possible to his second son. Now brace yourself, because this is where Tobin's serious offending began. On the 4th of August of 1993, Two 14-year-old girls had been in the area of Lee Park, which is quite a big housing estate in Portsmouth, well, haven't. And that's where Tobin's apartment, or new flat, was. They'd been there to visit a neighbour, and unfortunately they hadn't been in, so for some reason they knocked on Tobin's door and asked if they could stay there until the neighbour arrived. Unsure whether they knew Tobin or not, but they must have, because otherwise why would you randomly knock on some door and a middle-aged bloke answers and you go actually can we can we stay here for a while a bit odd unless they knew him anyway it turned out to be the worst decision they could have ever made knocking on that door because tobin held them both at knife point plied them with very strong alcohol cider vodka you name it until they were unconscious beat them and raped them and that's not even, even the worst of it. He was down in heaven, obviously, to be closer to his son, and guess who was staying with him during this ordeal? His four-year-old son was just in the other room as his father did this to these poor girls. Now, Tobin didn't leave it at that. He left these girls unconscious, turned on the gas to his oven without lighting it, took his son, and left them both for dead. Amazingly, the two girls survived the encounter, but Tobin did whatever he could to evade capture. He must have dropped his son off back at his ex's um, because he then went into hiding. He actually drove all the way from Havant to Coventry, which I'll show you the map and the distance, to get away from the police and joined the Jesus Fellowship, which was a religious sect up in Coventry. Fortunately, this proved fruitless um, and his own stupidity was his undoing because for some reason he went back to Brighton and his car, which was an Austin Metro, a blue one, was identified. He was very well known in the area and police arrested him. So on the 18th of May, 1994, whilst being tried at Winchester Crown Court, was sentenced to 14 years in prison for what he did to those young girls. Sadly, justice was not properly served, naturally. Because if you think about it, 14 years, not only did he sexually assault them, but he also attempted to murder them. Two girls, 14, and he only got 14 years. Now what makes it even worse is he was let out after only serving 10 years. So at 58 years old, Tobin was released back into society and returned to Renfrewshire, up in Scotland, where his killings started. Or did they resume? So what I just said may sound a little bit cryptic. So let me rewind a few years. This first murder that Tobin committed wasn't actually his first, but his last. However, police weren't aware of this until after he was caught for this murder. I'll explain. So in September 2006, just two years after his release from prison, Tobin was working as a handyman for a local church, St. Patrick's in Glasgow. And by this time, he was actually going by the name Pat McLaughlin, because, you've got to remember, he was still on the violent and sex offenders register. So it would have been difficult for him to get a job. So he thought, let's change my identity. I can get a handyman job and police won't know where I'm going, what I'm doing, who I'm seeing. He'd also had an arrest warrant notified against him in 2005 after he moved from his original home after he was released from prison in Paisley to where he was now in Glasgow. So. 
another reason he changed his name. He just didn't want the police to know what was going on. He didn't want to be arrested, thrown back in prison, breaking the terms of his parole. It was a bad guy. Now, it was at this church that he met 23-year-old Polish student Angelica Kluck. She'd been staying at the church. She'd been working as a cleaner to pay for her studies at the University of Gdansk. Now, not much is known about whether she'd had previous interactions with Tobin, but it seems likely considering they both worked on the same grounds at the church. Kluck was last seen in Tobin's company on the 24th of September 2006. According to forensics, it was highly probable that Tobin had actually attacked her where she was staying at the presbytery, which is a kind of residence for workers of the church. Now, similar to what happened with the 14-year-old girls, Tobin attacked her, beat her, raped her, and stabbed her. That wasn't the stab that killed Angelica. It's actually a lot worse. He actually buried her alive under the confessional in the church. And forensic evidence has now proven that she was still alive as she was buried. How twisted can you get? Now police started their investigations to find her and only a few days later on the 29th of September, less than a week after she was last seen with Tobin, police found her body. Now by this time, Tobin was up to his old tricks and had fled to London and had actually put himself into a hospital there with a fake condition. So he had some form of alibi. Fortunately, police weren't as easily fooled, um, saw through the lies and arrested him soon after for her murder. His trial started on the 23rd of March, 2007 and unsurprisingly ended in him being found guilty and sentenced to life with a minimum of 21 years. That terminology has always fascinated me. Life, but a time. Mm. Now, this seems like a really short case, done and dusted, guys in prison for the rest of his life. But as I mentioned earlier, this wasn't his first kill. This is where police first started to realize the depravity and evil they were dealing with, with Peter Tobin. Now, before we jump into our TARDIS and go a couple of decades back, I'll give you some insight. Thanks to Tobin's previous conviction, criminal history and transient lifestyle, Detective Superintendent Swindle of Strathclyde Police set up Operation Anagram. Now, what this was was a nationwide investigation into Tobin's life and movements to try and connect him to other crimes and missing persons. It started in 2006 and given his criminal history and personality, they felt compelled to try and investigate as this sort of man that could commit these sort of evil acts would surely have involvement in some of the crimes somewhere. And its aim was to trace Tobin's possible involvement in 13 other cases. Now you see why this case is so interesting and goes beyond just a, a few offenses and goes down so many different rabbit holes. As I mentioned right at the start, he was even suspected of being Bible John, a serial killer that's still unsolved to this day, and I might cover him in a future episode. But actually, it was later disproved, because two of the murders that happened, it, Tobin actually had an alibi of being down in the south coast, so it wasn't him. Thanks to Operation Anagram and the dedicated work of the officers that were working on it, Tobin's former house in Bathgate, which he lived in, remember, between 1990 and 1991, was searched in June 2007 in connection with the disappearance of 15-year-old Vicky Hamilton, who was actually last seen on the 10th of February 1991, whilst waiting for a bus home. Tobin left Bathgate and moved to Margate only a few weeks after her disappearance. Coincidence or pattern? Police were able to conduct a search in both the Bathgate and the Margate houses, and on the 14th of November 2007, they confirmed that human remains had been found in the back garden of 50 Irvine Drive, Margate. The remains were those of 15-year-old Vicky Hamilton. Now, further proof of Tobin's involvement is, is the MO. She had been sexually assaulted and stabbed, similar to the 14-year-old girls in Haven, similar to Angelica Cluck, it was adding up. He was sentenced again whilst in prison to another life term, and his minimum term was increased to 30 years this time. 
disgustingly lenient considering it was his second murder. An extra nine years for the death of another person. Now, Tobin, showing more of his uncaring, psychopathic side, decided to challenge this decision at the High Court because he felt, and listen to this, it was unfair. No remorse shown for the family of Vicky Hamilton, just Tobin, 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 his favourite subject. Now, the horror didn't end there. Now, in late 2007, Essex police reopened the investigation into a local girl's disappearance while she was in Hampshire. Now, if you don't know, Havant is within Hampshire. And we know who lived in Havant. This was 18-year-old Dina McNichol, who was last seen alive on the 5th of August, 1991, as her and a friend, a male friend, hitchhiked back from a music festival in Lippook, Hampshire. Supposedly, they'd accepted a lift from a, a male who pulled up and offered them one. Strangely enough, though, on the way back, her male friend left her in the car alone with this strange man after being dropped near Rygate, and McNichol was never seen again. Now, I don't care how friendly somebody appears. I'm not going to allow a friend to stay in a car with a stranger alone. It's just not going to happen. Now, investigating this, police noted that money had been withdrawn regularly from McNichols' building society over the following weeks from her disappearance, which actually was uncommon for McNichol because she'd spoken many times with her family and friends about saving for further studies and a bit of a gap year doing some travelling, as most people her age do. She never got to do it. Tobin cruelly took that away from her just two days after Vicky Hamilton's body was found in the back of Irvine Drive, police confirmed they found the remains of Dina McNichol. It took two years following this discovery for charges to be brought against Tobin. After the judge ruled that Tobin was not fit for trial due to medical reasons, he was pending surgery. Now on the 16th of December 2009, exactly two years after McNichol's body was found, the jury took less than 15 minutes to find Tobin guilty of the murder, and he was given a total life sentence. Now, I'm not an expert on the UK's criminal justice system, but if it takes three murders and a handful of brutal crimes to finally get you a life sentence with no possibility of parole, there's something drastically wrong. I'm all for rehabilitation, but not for these sort of crimes. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there were a lot of rabbit holes going on with this investigation in Operation Anagram, and Tobin was actually linked to a further nine crimes and disappearances, but ended up having no connection to any of them. Despite being in the area of a few of these girls' disappearances, he was proved to either have a legitimate alibi, the evidence had been destroyed because of how long it had been since the disappearance and when the investigation started, or that somebody else actually committed the crime or was involved for the disappearance. Two of the most notable, though, included Louise Kay, who'd gone missing from Beachy Head in Eastbourne during 1988. Now, Tobin had been working at a local hotel in the area at the time, and according to sources and friends, Kay had spoken about meeting a mysterious Scottish man shortly before she disappeared. Now, what's interesting about this case is that Louise drove a very memorable car, so the whole colour of the car was the same colour, but one panel of her door was like white, I think. So it was like a blue car with a white door. She used to sleep in her car on Beachy Head. Now the connections that people were making was uh, Tobin had history with working with car dealers, auctions, scrapyards. He was also a handyman. So there's speculation that he spray painted the door to make it look like an ordinary car, sold it, to hide up any evidence of his involvement. And if he did do that, it worked because the police couldn't find any evidence. But Mark Williams Thomas, a famous former police officer and now investigator, claimed in his 2018 documentary, The Investigator, A British Crime Story, that he believes Kay's body is still buried in the garden of Torbin's Brighton property. Now, the other notable case is that of Jesse Earle, who had vanished in 1980 again at Beachy Head in Eastbourne. She wasn't actually discovered until nine years later. 
so her body had already gone through the skeletonization process, which made it even more difficult to identify her. The 22 year old had been concealed so well in dense shrubland that that's why it took so long to find her. Now Earl had been found with her own bra used to tie her wrists together. Again, Earl had mentioned to friends and family um, about meeting this strange Scottish man who, while she was on her walks around Beachy Head, he'd been approaching her. And this was around the same area and where her body was found. So it's strange that the police weren't given these details so they could have narrowed down the search. I mean, I don't know what they were doing at the time, but that seems like a, a reasonable start to the investigation. A line of inquiry, if you will. Now, after Earl's body had been found, Tobin quickly moved his family back up to Scotland without any reasoning as to why he was doing it. Bit of a strange reaction if you had no involvement in it. Explains what I mentioned right at the start of this video and demonstrates how Tobin had a habit of moving himself, even his whole family, with no care about them, right across the country to escape any potential investigation. Again, another criminologist, David Wilson, in his 2012 documentary, Killers Behind Bars, The Untold Story, supporting why he thought Earl was another victim of Tobin. So the puzzle pieces fit perfectly for both of these unsolved murders, but sadly no convictions have ever come about, Tobin or any other party. Now Tobin spent the last of his days at HM Prison Edinburgh, where his health gradually deteriorated. On the 9th of August 2012, Tobin was taken to the Royal Edinburgh Infirmary after experiencing a suspected heart attack. He recovered from this, and then in July 2015, was attacked by another inmate with a razor blade, which left Tobin with a 20 centimetre scar running down his face and his neck. In February 2016, only a year later, Tobin was again admitted to hospital, this time with a suspected stroke. And in 2019, it was made public that he was very frail and probably suffering from cancer. Unsure which cancer, but it didn't take long to spread. And on the 8th of October 2022, Tobin died, aged 76. A few days before this video was made, his ashes were actually scattered at sea because None of his family or next of kin were interested in taking his body. And there we are, viewers. That ends the evil and grisly life and crimes of Peter Tobin. Not only did he prematurely end the lives of three young women who had their whole futures ahead of them, but he also left a trail of destruction and agony in his wake with other young women and girls and his own children. At least he can't hurt anyone else. And we can only hope that these missing people are found as soon as possible to bring some peace to their families. Thank you again for watching and I hope you enjoyed the content. If you did, then please send a super like, give us a thumbs up. Also, please do subscribe as well and hit that bell notification so you don't miss any future cases. As usual, stay safe.